Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Face to Face. I'm excited to be here talking with students, faculty, and staff innovators about what they're working on and how they're making a difference in the real world. The pandemic has been one of the most challenging times of a generation. Life as we knew it stopped, and we all had to figure out how to navigate the COVID-19 world. UC Davis has been a leader in many ways during this time, but the development of an asymptomatic rapid COVID test administered on campus has set us apart from all other universities in the world. As the New York Times wrote earlier this year, public health experts say the initiative is the most ambitious program of its type in the country and could be a model for other universities. My guest today is the founding director of the UC Davis Genome Center, which began in 2003. He and his team of researchers developed the saliva sample COVID testing program we've had in place since last summer. Dr. Richard Mitchellmore, welcome to Face to Face. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Glad you're here with us today. First, uh, can you just simply explain how you adapted this test and how it works? Okay, so my background is in plant pandemics. Now, I've actually been studying pandemics for 40 years, and not many people realize that actually our global food supply is perennially threatened by plant pandemics. Mm -hmm. So it's a relatively simple transition to think about how we screen at scale for a human path pathogen. I was very familiar with the high throughput technology that was available in plant agricultural biotech. And the medical community just was testing at scale. So there are a number of lessons we took from the ag biotech community. Keep it simple. Don't assay more than you need. Get it in 96 format as soon as you can. Keep it cheap. Keep it accurate. And so we took all of that and translated it into uh, sampling saliva, a very small amount, keeping a very, very simple workflow, and then doing it cheaply and fast using machines that were originally developed in the ag biotech sector. Well, it's really been an innovative game changer uh, and perhaps even a lifesaver. We don't know. We could have saved some lives using this technology. So hats off to you. So Richard, uh, I think people would be uh, curious to know about the how the idea originated uh, for adapting the test. And I know in my case, you know, actually Ken Burtis came to my office and said, Richard Mitchell-Moore has this idea and we think we can do this test at scale and, and do it much faster than uh, people are doing with the nasal swabs. When did it come to you that, that this could be done here at the Genome Center? Well, back in February and March, I was aware that there was a testing uh, shortage and I was familiar with the technology in the ag biotech sector, but it took a while for me to really uh, talk to the right people, get LGC on board who we collaborate with, and sort of put the whole thing together. But that really is the back end of the system. I knew what the technology was capable of. Mm -hmm. I was very daunted by the front end of collecting all the samples yeah. and the back end of doing the contact tracing. Yeah. And what has really been impressive and remarkable to me is how so many people on campus came together. People in uh, HR, people in legal, people in purchasing, uh, just to mention a few. And people yeah. really, and actually Kelly Ratliff, I mean, she basically said, make it happen. <laughs> and it happened, Huge. you know, because everybody came together. It just shows what the campus can do when everyone pulls in the same direction. That's so true. It's so inspirational what Healthy Davis Together has been able to do. Exactly. People come to take to get their test, <clears throat> they just spit into the tube and, it, and then you know, 24 hours later they get an email. But so much has happened between that moment yeah. and, uh, and, and I'm they, really glad. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, people don't realize how much it takes to make this university run smoothly. And this is the epitome of it. They just come in, they spit, it's very, very simple. They mm -hmm. don't realize the amount of logistics. I mm -hmm. mean, even the parking and the traffic flow, everything has been taken care of. Right, right. Uh, and, and so it works because everybody's pulled together. It's, exactly. it's quite remarkable. It really is. We've had contributions from all over the campus to make this work, but none more important than yours. So we really appreciate that. Um, I'm the back end. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the guy behind, behind the screening. Okay. I'm, I'm the architect, but an architect <laughs> is no good unless you have people that executes on those designs. That's a great uh, analogy. 
And I would also make a great pitch for the lab. I mean, the lab has been incredible. The lab was opening at six o'clock in the morning and it, they worked through until 10 or 11 at night to get this up and running. Well, we're all grateful to everyone involved, including uh, uh, yourself and, and everyone else who's, who's been uh, part of the uh, part of the Healthy Davis Together. Well, thank you initiative. also for your support. It doesn't happen without everybody going in the right direction. I appreciate that. Now, I hear we're also now testing for variants uh, of the virus. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about this and how important it is? Right. So actually, these machines were designed to detect DNA differences in plant material. So it's basically very, very simple to do the same test, but now uh, looking for slightly different variants in the, D in the RNA sequence using the same technology. It's basically right. very, very similar. Now, it's very important because the virus is changing all the time, mm -hmm. but most of those changes are irrelevant. But a few of them increase infectivity, and over time, I'm afraid, are going to uh, render the vaccines relatively ineffective. So it's very important that we detect these variants and fi find a way to deal with them. So uh, exactly. testing for them is critical. Uh, beyond the testing, can you tell, talk a little bit about the overall impact of the Genome Center? We've had it for nearly 20 years now, and where do you see things going there? Well, uh, the Genome Center was set up originally to be a, a super school. You know, it, it spans across schools and colleges to provide enabling technology for high throughput biology. You know, we allow research at the DNA, the RNA, the protein, the metabolite, and the data level at scale in a way that an individual investigator would not be able to do. Is our Genome Center unique? Uh, are, there, are there similar facilities <clears throat> around the country? Uh, we are unique in what we do, but there are certainly other genome centers with other flavors. Some are bigger, uh, like the Broad, uh, at MIT. I mean, right. you know, they do stuff at scale beyond what we can do. Uh, then there's a lot of small genome centers that are just one or two technologies. So we're probably, there are six to eight, 10, similar in scale to us, but we we just do it slightly differently. Understood. Thank you. So but you, you yourself have been at UC Davis for almost 40 years. Can you tell us what's been a memorable event or occurrence or discovery in those 40 years? I don't know. It's kind of a bit of a blur in some ways. I can't believe I've been here for 40 years. I'm still deciding what I want to do. <laughs> but I can, you know, I have vivid memories of my early days when I first arrived. Uh, Davis has grown a lot during that period of time. Mm -hmm. It's matured. There's new buildings. The, the facilities here, the sports facilities, you know, it used to be Hickey Gym was yeah. the gym. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the track around beside Hickey Gym was a sports stadium. And clearly things have changed there. And the same on the research, the, the capability exhibited by the uh, by the Genome Center. It has really gone up, gone up a tremendous amount. Well, we hope that growth pattern continues and we keep evolving and getting better over exactly. the next 40 years. Well, the, the motto of the Genome Center, I'm a geneticist, evolve or die. <laughs> Pretty appropriate and accurate. <laughs> uh, okay, Richard, now we're going to have a little fun. Uh, this is the part of the show where we help uh, our viewers learn a little bit about you. Uh, we call this the hot seat segment. Uh, so I'm going to ask you some very fast questions, and we're looking for a one word or so answer, okay? All set? Uh, Greatest scientific discovery of all time? Uh, structure of DNA. Hard to argue with that. Biggest change on campus since you first arrived? Probably the arc. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so when you need a break from your work at the Genome Center, what's your go-to activity? What, what's a break? <laughs> That's the right answer to the pro to the chancellor. Now, uh, I, do, uh, I I like to go windsurfing in Hawaii. Windsurfing, great. Uh, best thing about living in Davis. Best thing about living there. Uh, you'll never hear an Englishman complain about the sun. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Last one. Name something you think the world could use more of. Uh, communication and science-based decision-making. Can't argue with those either. I agree with wholeheartedly. Okay, now it's your turn. You can ask me anything. Uh, what would you like to know? Uh, so many things. Um, maybe at the sort of campus level, you know, things are getting increasingly computational, both in, in the way we do research and society as a whole. And it's a big challenge. How do you, what's your vision? How do you think we're going to be able to develop the computational resources to keep up with frontline research? That's a great question. And I think it sort of depends on what role we would like to play in high performance computing, right? Do we want to be, do we want to establish a facility uh, where we'd have to build something, equip it, uh, 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 staff it? Or would we like to take advantage of the distributed network that's already there of, of computing facilities and just hire the expertise and get the time and the access to the facilities? I think it's probably more of the latter for us, uh, although I wouldn't rule out the former, but I think it's more of the latter. Mm -hmm. I, I personally, I think we need to have a, a, a mixture of both. Mixture, yeah. Uh, that's probably a way to do that, yeah. Yeah. Any other uh, questions for me? Oh, plenty. Um, <laughs> Another one somewhat related to that is the speed of technological change is accelerating. Yep. You know, in my lab, we're doing things we didn't even have the vocabulary for five to 10 years ago. And it's the same in society, the, the impact of the cell phone. What's your vision for educating students for, to accommodate this tremendous change that's inevitable over the next 10 to 20 years? Yeah, I mean, that's really the question because uh, we used to spend time teaching students facts and things that they had to know, mm -hmm. but now all the facts they ever need are in their cell phone. They have access to them easily. So I think now what we need to do is to teach students, uh, prepare students for jobs that don't even exist yet. And you do that by right. teaching them critical thinking and how to find uh, information and resources they need to solve problems or to achieve a, a, a certain task or to perform a certain task. And, um, we do that by experiential learning, uh, hands-on activities, uh, more open-ended uh, classroom activities. Uh, and, and that's where I'd like to, that's the direction I'd like to, to move the university in terms of our curriculum. So, yeah, that, that'd be great. Yeah. So um, Richard, just thank you so much for all you've done for the university and for Davis and really you know, uh, for, for uh, uh, society this year through your work. Uh, thanks for your time today, obviously, uh, and thanks to all our viewers who are watching. Uh, we'll see you next time here on Face to Face. Go Ags!